Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special post-wrestling WrestleNomics collaboration. I am John Pollock, joined by Brandon Thurston, and we have a very special guest with us. The story of 2022 in professional wrestling centered around Vince McMahon, which is probably how 2023 will focus on as well. A perfect time to pick up a copy of Ringmaster, Vince McMahon and the Unmaking of America. Abraham Reisman is our guest today. And uh, Abraham, thank you so much for joining us. It is a, as always, um, tumultuous time when it centers around one Vince McMahon and having a chance to um, get an advanced copy of your book. I think a lot of people are going to learn many new things about Vince McMahon that have never truly been, been covered in this depth. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. I mean, I've, I've always been from the very beginning nervous about the reception among the wrestling press and the so-called IWC, the online presence of uh, wrestling fandom, just because I'm not really a part of that world. Like I was apart from wrestling for 20 odd years. I watched it obsessively as a teenager, stopped for 20 years, and then I had the idea to write this biography of Vince McMahon and dove back in. So there's this wide interim of stuff that I'm just, not really like that of, of like of conversations that I wasn't a part of. So it's really gratifying to hear people as plugged in as yourself um, say that there's, there's something new in there. I really worked hard to try and break at least a little new ground and not just regurgitate what's already been out there. Yeah. And Do you think I, it- I, I, I can add to like, as you know, reading it, I'm very sensitive to how, People who are just sort of swooping in and covering a wrestling story may, may, can show how they're they're not fully in tune with what's going on. And I think there's not not only are you well researched in the topic that you're writing about, but also I think you make some very insightful comments on just how wrestling is is being created and how the audience and the performers are interacting in some some really insightful ways that we might thank you that means a great deal i appreciate that your your reporting uh was essential in getting this book done especially you you uncovering numbers on revenue for the wwf back when it was the wwf from the 80s through the 90s was just un before they go public that was essential. So I'll not like I have to tell any of your listeners and viewers to read Brandon Thurston, but you all should read Brandon. If you can kind of uh, break it down for us as well, like you're entering an industry that, you know, the, the kind of reporting that is out there, like it's few and far between. This is an industry that is based on secrecy and letting the public sort of just see sort of the, the end product, but not really turn under the rock and look at what's underneath. That's a lot of what your book is. And it's kind of uh, finding out like an industry that is so shrouded in secretness and, and performers as well that leap to defend the, the, the honor of the industry, so to speak, of not talking about a lot of these issues. Absolutely. Well, that last point is really interesting because, you know, there's this three word credo that everybody lives by in the wrestling ecosystem, which is protect the business. It's there is this entity that is wrestling, whether you want to think of it as an industry or an art form or whatever noun you want to use, wrestling exists, but wrestling is fragile. This is the, this is the myth. This is the um, thing that everybody gets told if you become a wrestler or become otherwise involved. Um, the wrestling industry is fragile. And if you do something that is, you know, derogatory or detrimental to wrestling, it could have horrible consequences that you will be held accountable for. This is why people, I mean, that culture dates back so far that, you know, that's why kayfabe, why the truth of pro wrestling was not revealed for so long, despite the fact that you have all of these wrestlers who come in and out and could theoretically just tell anybody, but you really get it drummed into you that you have to protect business. And that used to meant used to mean not letting anyone know that wrestling was fake. Um, but now protect the business has this more ambiguous um, agenda to it because for one thing, there's one guy who basically is the business, at least from a financial standpoint, and that's Vince. And so once you have somebody who remakes the image, uh, remakes the industry in their image and kind of becomes a, a near monopoly, you know, now you have AEW, but even with AEW, it's still this massive 
entity, WWE, once you make one man's interests synonymous with the business's interests, which is very much what Vince has done, both on TV and behind the scenes, then all of a sudden people are just defending one person against any, any attacker, against anyone who might want to accuse or come after him. So, you know, Vince has this very weird place in people's hearts if they're wrestlers who've worked for him or bookers or whoever, in that they love wrestling and Vince gave them most of their wrestling. You know, historically, most of the wrestling that we, that the, the millennials and the Xers and even some of the boomers have watched is Vince McMahon wrestling. He's been the, the, the driving force um, for so long. And not the only driving force, but he's been such a major player for so long that now if you come after Vince, it feels like you're coming after the very foundation of the business, and that's how you keep people from speaking out. Along those lines, I was wondering if you could tell us, compared to other products you've worked on, the previous book was about Stan Lee, the comic book writer. Yes. When it came to talking to subjects, especially those who directly worked with Vince, was it hard to get people to to talk to you? Um, I mean, it depends. There's a wide range. There were some people who were ready to speak um, and kind of just waiting for the opportunity. Some people who I thought would be overjoyed to speak, given how much they talk, um, but who, shockingly, once I came calling, um, didn't want to uh, you know return my calls. Um, people who will go nameless right now, but people who just have, you know, shout around on podcasts and will give a quote to a mainstream press outlet all the time. Once you come saying, Hey, I'm doing an investigative unauthorized biography of Vince McMahon, there's some people who don't, who kind of clam up. But, you know, look, part of the job of being a journalist is gaining people's trust that you're a professional and that you're not going to misrepresent them. And that's, what I have spent a lot of time in my career trying to figure out how to do, you know, solidifying my own ethics for myself and then, you know, reaching out to people and making it clear that I'm not coming at this from an unscrupulous place, you know? And so some people were harder to get than others. Um, I think the biggest surprise to me uh, in terms of accessibility was the amount of time I got with Bret Hart who spoke to me for, I, I, I should go back and actually count up all the minutes, but, you know, we we had a number of phone conversations and then met in person, and it was probably about eight, nine hours of, of chatting with, with Brett, and that was broken up over a number of conversations where after every conversation, when we were finishing up, Brett would say, you know, if you need anything else, anytime, you just call, which was very helpful because he's about as close to a journalist as you get on the inside of the locker room for wrestling because he was keeping those audio diaries mm -hmm. contemporaneously and then, you know, consulting that archive, which, you know, obviously Brett has his own agenda, but talking to him at length is useful because I think at the very least, I think Brett actually knows what he experienced and because of those audio diaries and because of the memoir, I think he has a record of what he actually experienced. Now, whether he chooses to tell you everything, that's up to Brett, I suppose. But I think unlike a lot of other wrestlers, he's not walking around having worked himself into a shoot about what actually occurred to him. Like, there are a lot of folks in wrestling who, for various reasons, whether it's through, you know, they've had a lot of head trauma and they're not thinking clearly anymore, or they've had a lot of drug problems and they're not thinking clearly anymore, or, as is often the case, They've just told a kayfabe lie for so long that they've come to really believe it about themselves. You really often can't get great information from a lot of folks who've been in the ring. But Brett was was uh, was pretty lucid and um, had the archive to go back and consult. So valuable. Um, I could go on, but there that was that was that was about as big a surprise as I found in terms of people who were willing to talk to me. Um, in the industry, at least. I mean, a bunch of other random people who I was very lucky to find who are not in the wrestling business, but who are uh, adjacent to Vince in one way or another, um, including a childhood friend of Vince's stepbrother 
who it turned out, who knew Vince when Vince was a small child, who turned out to be the guy who cremated Andre the Giant, which I don't know if that means anything, but it's one of those completely eerie coincidences that Vince was cremated, uh, that Andre was cremated within walking distance of where Vince was born. But anyway, now I'm rambling. You you, you go on, ask a question. <laughs> well, I, I, I kind of wanted to dovetail off of that because, you know, not to get into all the specifics, but I thought the kind of the origin story of Vince McMahon is fascinating when you're the amount of research that you did into a lot of his upbringing. And I, I'm curious as you probably went into this sort of with a idea of Vince McMahon modern day, how much of that sort of upbringing sort of informed you of the individual this, this man became. Right. I knew, I, you know, it's sometimes hard to remember what you knew when you knew it, but Going into the research for this project, I didn't know much about Vince's upbringing. I think I'd read the Playboy interview that was published in early 2001 when I was a teen because it came out around when I was, I don't, I didn't have a subscription to Playboy. I was only, you know, 14, 15, but, um, I believe that was circulated online. So I think I'd read that. I had some vague echoes in my mind about Southern upbringings, but when I started doing the research, um, I was really, uh, I was initially somewhat captured by Vince's narrative about what his youth was, which is what he presented in that Playboy interview, as well as a few others that he did around the turn of the millennium when he was still willing to talk about himself. Um, he really presented himself as this rough and tumble, defiant, um, almost unlikable kid who was constantly getting into fights and getting into trouble and pulling pranks. Um, he was describing himself basically as a heel, as a youth. And what I found was that this was an entirely manufactured characterization of himself. You know, I interviewed dozens and dozens of people from the three areas where Vince grew up in North Carolina, um, Moore County, Craven County, and uh, Weeksville. And um, I, everyone I met said, you know, Vince was a pretty nice guy, kid, rather. You know, he was relatively easy to deal with. He was not cruel. He wasn't getting into fights. You know, we didn't know him to get into anything like that. But what I did find, which was fascinating to me, and I get into it some degree in the book, was um, that Vince, in fact, got into pro wrestling a lot earlier than people expected in terms of actually producing pro wrestling. He was doing that at his military school in high school. Um well before he entered the industry formally. And he's never talked about that. And he hasn't talked about that because if he were to let people know, I mean, this is my suspicion, I suppose. If he were to let people know that his childhood, any brutality he was engaging in was mostly theatrical. Um, and that usually he was a pretty well-liked, personable kid. Excuse me, that would shatter the illusion. You know, that would break kayfabe. That's one of the main takeaways that I got from from reading especially that the early part of the book, which is so about the genealogy. Um, and it's like, like this notion that he, he was this, this delinquent kid, but then, you know, you know, clearly telling, telling that story after the fact, maybe, but it, it seems like the, I could draw the line maybe at 2001 where I, I see it almost as like part of his public persona. However, that may be manufactured or not, but it seems to me like if his, his TV appearances and his TV interviews, you draw the line about 2001 when hey, is the Bob know, Costas get, interview around then, you know, exactly. I mean, exactly. Yeah. And the Armageddon is 2003. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like maybe he just changed as a person having, you know, won the wrestling war and well, WCW that's was a out of business. Point. I mean, I'll, I'll warn people who are reading the book, you know, I didn't literally didn't have the word count and the amount of space that I needed to tell the story of Vince's entire life in detail. So this book's core narrative, I, for a while I was embarrassed about telling people this, but I feel pretty confident about the quality of the book now. So I'll just say the core narrative ends in 1999, in the summer of 1999. And then there's a robust epilogue, but I didn't have, Vince's life has been so eventful. And so dense with meaning and with uh, fascinating supporting characters that there just wasn't a way I could fit it into a, a book that was the size, a size that, you know, a general reader who's not necessarily into wrestling uh, might pick it up. Um, 
but you're you're right, and that's actually something I would love to explore in a sequel. I'm not promising that one exists, uh, but I really do hope that at some point I can revisit this story and sort of pick it up in 1999 and then take it to wherever the end zone ends up being. Um, but you know, you are right. I think Vince did Vince did not be, is not static after 1999. I, I get him to the point where he's kind of at the height of his buzz powers. You know, he beats, in 2001, he actually beats WCW and eats ECW. But even by then, the momentum is starting to wane a little bit. It's kind of the same joke over and over again with a lot of the characters that got over in 97, 98. And 99, I think, really is sort of Vince at the height of his power. I think there's there's this, um, even though, and you know what, that said, I may be biased because that was when I started watching wrestling. So I should, I should absolutely acknowledge that for me, mid 1999 feels like the peak because that was when I was watching. But I think you can make a solid argument that that year is when, um, Vince is kind of cresting in a lot of ways. But, Mm -hmm. um, uh, now I can't even remember what your question was. Sorry. Just just to add to it, like, I think there's, we get, I don't know how far we want to go in psychoanalyzing Vince, but when I think back to the um, the late 2014 interview that he did with Steve Austin, which was early in the network days, and he he makes this this comment kind of in passing about how when when Linda was running for for office when she ran for Senate and he would go with her to campaign events and how he would feel so uncomfortable and he would feel so shy being there and and and, and Austin is flabbergasted you know Austin who knows Vince very well he's just flabbergasted that that Vince McMahon would feel uncomfortable in social situations it sounds ridiculous to him and it's, it sounds like you know, maybe there's these this this dual you know, psychology. I mean, the other thing is you can't take Vince at his word about what he's really like, you know, you know, just because he says, Oh, I go to these black tie events and I feel uncomfortable. That could very easily be, you know, what yours truly is, is perhaps vainly trying to get over as a new word, but Neo kayfabe, you know, when you're coming up with kayfabe about what's happening behind the scenes and you're mixing truth and lies, you know, that, that, um, that's a phenomenon that you really see when Vince is describing his personal life. So I would not be surprised if Vince is actually pretty confident at events like that. And in fact, is saying that as a way of conveying one of the main narratives he has about himself on the rare occasions when he talks about himself, which is I'm the common man. I'm not a rich j- jerk. You know, that's not who I really am. What I do, I do for the business and out of love of the business, etc. You know, he he has to kind of reinforce this idea that him as a bad guy is perhaps just a joke. You know, this is the armor that he wears in order to walk through the world near and vulnerable, which is how things have worked out for him, is he has this persona of evil that he plays on television, and he lets everyone think, well, we're not sure whether that's really a portrayal of how he is or whether that's a character. And as long as that ambiguity is there, he can get away with being just like his character in real life. But um, people will just sort of assume, oh, well, he's just doing a gag. And when I say people, I mean especially mainstream journalists and legal authorities and regulatory agencies. They tend to look at wrestling, and this dovetails with something you were saying before, you know, they look at the end product and the end product is silly to them. So they assume that the process that led to that product was also silly and that was staffed and funded by silly people. And of course that couldn't be farther from the truth. This is true with comic books as well. I ran into this with Stan Lee. You had Stan Lee getting away with outrageous deceptions about his life and accomplishments, mainly because people just figured when they were writing articles for mainstream outlets or for history books, well, Stan's, just, you know, it, it's comics. Who cares? You know, I mean, there's no way that Stan Lee could be doing something bad because uh, comics are so silly. He must just be a lighthearted guy the way he's presenting himself to me. And that was, of course, a character. And it's the same with Vince. It's more complicated with Vince, in fact. But he has this persona of Mr. McMahon that functions as a kind of armor that prevents him from having to uh, obey conventional morality. Let's say that. 
it's it's something that uh, Brandon and I always talk about is sort of just viewing kind of the mainstream coverage of, you know, when a pro wrestling story breaks through and it's always, you know, Vince McMahon is against the ropes and we've got the most ridiculous B-roll footage of Vince that it's this ultimate shield behind these horrific allegations. And we don't have to go all that further back that the return to power of Vince McMahon and this palace intrigue greatly overshadowed a settlement with Rita Chatterton recently that got got almost no attention outside of you know wrestling media and here is a story that dates back to the media people barely talked about it it was yesterday's news before it was yesterday you know and it's just it's very interesting to look at this handling of Vince McMahon even compared to last summer when he first stepped down versus today that it almost seems that it's it doesn't have the same uh, resonance even at the mainstream level and it contrasts as well to like the early 90s uh, when you look at the ring boy scandal oh, and yeah. and and who was covering it at that time it was a lot of daytime talk shows mm-hmm. the new york post and wrestling newsletters but it didn't really crack into a, a, a national scandal no i mean the closest thing was the steroids aspect of it but that was just sort of collateral damage and a larger panic about drugs. This was something that I tried to put in context in the book, is we tend to look at the steroid scandal in isolation for different industries, right? Like baseball historians will talk about steroids in baseball kind of in isolation. And certainly with wrestling, we tend to talk about it as like, okay, well, there was this era when people were doing steroids and then Vince had to go to trial and he won. You know, there's this kind of simplistic narrative about it. But steroids were part of this larger panic about drugs and youth doing drugs and like youth and the war on drugs. It was part of this larger, you know, um, panic about uh, all of that stuff. And steroids kind of get caught up in it. And that's the only reason Vince was really held to account at the time was there was this overall kind of anti-drug dealer uh, vibe going on in American politics and media. And then subsequent to that, it's just been I mean, like kind of when during after the Chris Benoit murder suicide, you know, he Vince and Linda had to appear before the Waxman Commission and talk about wrestling. But what's fascinating about that was, you know, I don't know if I'm sure you have read the testimonies that they gave there. What's fascinating is you have Linda being Linda, you know, ever the professional, the moderate, etc., and you have Vince just being a jerk to this congressional subcommittee. Like he's just openly taunting them basically and you know they ask him about drug rehab programs for older superstars and he goes well that's just pr i don't actually believe i have any responsibility for any of that you know and even then vince has this aura of invincibility and i think a lot of that happens after or as a result of really the scandals of the early 90s because by many accounts vince was convinced he was going to jail Vince really thought when the federal government came after him that he was not going to escape jail time. And who can blame him? I mean, the federal government usually wins cases that they bring to trial. Um, But the point was he didn't think of himself as invulnerable yet. I think winning and then managing to get the company back on its feet really did make him think he was invincible. And it also gave him a new enemy, which was the media. Like the first people that he ever cut heel promos on were – were, you know, outside of Phil Mushnick, yeah. Were, were like, you know, Phil Mushnick. Like he was, he was going after members on, and the people who wrote that Village Voice article. You know, he'd cut these negative promos about how the media was out to get him. And it's just Mr. McMahon avant la let. And I think he really just figured out how to work the media better. I think he figured out how to work the media better. I think he gained a confidence that allows him to operate without shame. Um, and without fear. And that's, uh, that's quite the combination when you can operate without shame or fear and you feel as though nothing can harm you. You know, it's, uh, it's a wild situation. He's, a, he is both representative of a lot of people who are successful in America, but also he's kind of sui generis. Like there's nobody exactly like Vince. Vince is this very weird, unique character who has very strong connections and echoes with other major American characters. But when you really get granular, you're like, this guy, I don't think we'd ever replicate this. Yeah, this was c- kind of a subject in the Nick Khan interview that I did with Bill Simmons recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where 
Simmons asks, you know, he, he brings up that, you know, Vince hasn't talked to the public about, about this at all. He's, there's a press release. There's, there's nothing directly addressing the allegations against him. And so and I, he did an interview with Pat McAfee last year, about a year ago. Yeah. That was his first sit down video interview, I think, since that Austin interview in December 2014. So I believe that's, almost, that's true. Uh, he ha- it certainly hadn't done anything of that length in a very long time. Yeah, I just want to your thoughts. Like, what what leads him to basically just shut down on talking to the media, whereas he had done interviews, and you know, fairly often. Right. I, you know, I think somewhere along the line, I don't think it happened immediately. I think it happened gradually. If you look at my research packets where I put all the articles that I find, you know, the features and interviews that the media put out about Vince and with Vince, it it just starts to get spottier as the aughts go on. And then by the teens, he's really not talking much at all. I don't think there was like a singular event that turned him off from talking to the press. I think I would hazard a guess that it's part of a larger trend in corporate thinking that I can't, I'm not an MBA, not that an MBA necessarily qualifies you to answer this question, but I don't really know what the larger trend is, but you see it in police departments, you see it in corporate America, you see it in the offices of elected officials. In the past 20 years, access for media has just radically declined in every industry. And I think Vince is attuned to that and has kind of gotten away with that. I think he reached a point where talking about himself had done all it could do for him and like revealing parts of his psyche had done all it could do. And he kind of followed the larger trend, which was just shut up and don't, don't put yourself out there beyond what your very controlled vision of yourself that you want to present is, you know, you don't want to, you don't want other people framing your narrative anymore. The idea of being real, maybe this is it. The idea of being like real and raw and unadulterated if you're a celebrity in an interview, that's kind of a thing of the past. Nobody really expects that anymore. Like that's not – celebrity interviews are so choreographed and written by such friendly writers that we're not used to that kind of interview style or reporting style anymore. I think that's another trend that has led to this. But I think Vince – yeah, Vince, I don't know if there was a turning point specifically, but – he he has gradually just sort of realized that shutting up is is his better move and only presenting himself on these sort of papal occasions when he decides that the people can see him and he delivers a very controlled address. And one of the other big takeaways I got from, from reading is that it, it, it sounds like he's actually closer with Donald Trump than, than I would imagine him being. I'd imagine like the, the Trump and Vince relationship to be, you know, they, they were definitely friendly and they had a business relationship and obviously they worked together in the WrestleManias in 88 and 89 and they worked together in the, the you know, late 2000s when Trump, when, when Trump was on TV. And that's where yeah. we get all that, that great B-roll from. Um, but I didn't, I don't imagine them, you know, having like a, a as close to a friendship as it, as it sounds, according to your book, that, that maybe they, they did and that they did have, you know, close uh, phone conversations, apparently. They did. I mean, as far as I've been told, you know, of course, getting any information about Trump requires you going into the whole hall of mirrors that is Trump kayfabe and talking to Trump sources who are much like wrestlers, never reliable because they know that their job is to obey their promoter, in this case, Donald Trump. Um, but all of that said, people I've spoken to, especially Sam Nunberg, who was a campaign advisor um, on the first campaign, you know, I've spoken to multiple people who say that they are about as close as either man gets with sort of a fellow male outside his family. Um, now, I don't know if that I think with Vince, Vince has more. I don't know now he may have alienated too many people, but he's, he's historically had a few more confidants than Trump. Trump notoriously just doesn't really have friend friends, but it seems from my research and from what Sam Nunberg told me that the relationship is close enough that when Trump, uh, takes calls from Vince, he makes everybody else leave the room. I don't know how often they're talking, but he wants the conversations to be private is what I've, what I've been told. And again, 
you know, in the book, I tell you where I got this stuff from. And I'm hoping that the reader is intelligent enough to know that you can't necessarily trust Republican political pundits and operatives. But I think it's very plausible that they would be pretty close friends or at least really trust each other uh, to the extent that either man can trust anybody. I think they really share an aesthetic and an approach to life and the theory of knowledge and the theory of mind of others that I think unites them. But I don't know how often they're talking. I won't claim to know that, I, you know, I haven't been able to FOIA any um, communications with Vince McMahon through the White House. I think any time they were communicating while Linda was the director of Small Business Administration, which is the other factor you have to think about. You know, Linda is very connected to Trump if through political, you know, party machinations. Um, but Vince is not the only one who has Trump on speed dial is the, is the point. Yeah, it, it's interesting to think about what happened with Vince over the summer and, and him yeah. retiring slash resigning if he, if he had any conversations with, with I Trump know at that time. this is. Well, this is the big thing, you know, I, I, I can tell you and hopefully not sound like too much of a bad reporter, but I have had a devil of a time trying to find any kind of reliable information about Vince's thinking in leaving or coming back, coming back. I don't think you have to think too hard about, I think it was kind of inevitable that he would try that. Mm -hmm. Um, but why did he quote unquote step down or step back? However they phrased it. You know, yeah. he and then retire or or whatever, resign. Um, you know, I remember at the time I wrote for the Washington Post. I was like, don't count him out. Like, he's still the single largest shareholder individually and controls about 80 percent of the shareholder votes. So he's still the ultimate power at this publicly traded company. Um, so I wasn't surprised that he came back. I just don't know why he showed any weakness to begin with. It's very unlike him to back down. You know, the reports have been. He took advice from bad, you know, bad advice from people is what he's saying. But I, I do hope if I get this sequel that I'll be able to uncover the full story of what happened last summer that led to Vince stepping down. I mean, it's such a black box. I don't think anybody, you know, the Wall Street Journal has gotten a lot of hot tips and I've spoken to those reporters, but they, they don't know what's going on inside Vince's head. Basically only Vince does. Yeah, I, I, I said half joke. You know, the best, the best uh, business deal that Nick has ever negotiated is uh, is convincing the man to step down. I imagine he was at least part of that advice that 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 Vince was listening to at that time. I believe. Yeah, it's probably true. I believe Pity Insider reported that in some somewhere around July 10th, somewhere in that neighborhood. I'd have to look at the, the report that they report that they they had made the decision about about him stepping down, and then he actually did do do the stepping down on July 22nd. Yeah. So it sounds like that was something that was just you know they planned on doing it for a week or two before it actually happened. And could be. Uh, or it could yeah. be a lot weirder. We we really don't know. I mean, it's uh, there's one thing I've learned about Vince. It's that he has a taste for the theatrical. And brings that into the boardroom. You know, I think it's these are theatrical and he knows how to manipulate people's perception of what's happening behind the scenes. You know, he knows who to call to plant a story that will make it look like something is happening at his company that isn't. You know, I, I just it's it's hard to trust any of the reports that are coming in. This is one of the reasons why I like you. You're willing to admit when there's a real gap in our conclusive knowledge and you, you know, you poured a lot of cold water onto the whole Saudi Arabia sale overnight thing that, that happened. And, you know, um, the reports, you know, the, the viral misreport. So anyway, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. Hopefully we'll find out. I think someday we will know what happened in these machinations. I, I, I say that because I have found with both of the biographies I've written and with the one I'm working on, now that I can't talk about it because it's not sold yet. Um, you know, it gets a lot easier to report on something that's older. The mm -hmm. more time has passed, the more people are willing to tell you what actually happened and the more you can actually get documentation of what happened. So I'm not going to say anything conclusive about why he left yet because I don't think those answers are really available to anybody yet. Yet. Emphasis on yet. Having to navigate this wrestling fan base and not to generalize everybody, but 
you know, for, for people that follow this at a pretty dedicated level, you know, they, they've come up and over the years, they, they've learned about the Rita Chatterton stories. They've learned about the Ring Boy scandal. And it's sort of, if you enjoy this form of entertainment, there is a sort of kind of, you have to accept, like, there's a really dark element to it. Yep. Do you, do you get the sense that a fan base has kind of had to have this reckoning with themselves over oh, like, yeah, this, yeah. this no, Vince McMahon totally scandal? Like, like, there's no just, you know, separating it because it's so no. out in front over this last no, year. But this is, this is the thing, you know, part of the point of my book is it gets us to 1999, which may not seem like the present, but I would argue that wrestling in 1999 is where we're at like now, you know, like that's in a political sense, in a sort of global sense, mentally, America is at a point that wrestling fandom was at in 1999 in a lot of respects in this this sense of unreality and scandal and depravity and i think where wrestling is at now is in many ways kind of a vision of our dark future if we don't avert it (laughs) in our own time as a society which is this complete across the board cynicism like that is what you have in wrestling when it comes to immoral acts that are alleged or even proven in wrestling because everyone is such a cynic about it because it's so prevalent. And I'm not even blaming the individual fans. I'm, I'm blaming the system, which of course is a useless thing to blame because you don't know how to actually fight a system. But, um, you know, the whole system encourages fans who love this art form to have to just swallow the fact that their art form is made by bastards. You know, it ends up being this real bind where like, find me the honest man in wrestling, you know, find me the one person who has never compromised their morals or done something uh, unspeakable. It's really hard to find somebody. If for no other reason, then you get dinged immediately for having worked with Vince. You know, Vince is somebody who's demonstrated uh, a lot of traits and has been accused of a lot of things that you'd like to think a healthy society would really reject or at least investigate and not reject as in deny, but reject mm-hmm. as in say, this is terrible. We should, we should not have this person around, or at least we should investigate what happened. And yet because those moments of reckoning have not led to anything and Vince remains this preeminent guy preeminent force in wrestling. If you love the art form of wrestling, you kind of have to just make your peace with the fact that you're loving something that enriches somebody who you don't particularly like. Now that's not unique to wrestling. That's very true in sports. The owners of these teams um, in any number of sports are just, you know, horrific people very often, but you like sports. Like what are you going to do? That's what the norm is. And so you just try to enjoy this thing that you love, uh, this form that you love, even though the person who's who's benefiting and profiting off of that form is somebody who you really don't agree with. So I hope we don't all end up like that about everything, but it is what I fear. The, I think one of the themes of the book, and, and the, the subtitle is, is what? It's The Unmaking of America. And I get, right. I, I, I get the sense that, you know, Vince is this kind of like life lifetime symbol of a lot of the ideals of like what, the, what people talk about when they talk about the American dream and a lot of the, the hubris that comes with that in terms of he's somebody who by all accounts, you know, he grew up in a trailer park in North Carolina. Uh, he had a lot of disadvantages. He was abused in his childhood, but in certainly in his view, he, he grabbed his own bootstraps and he overcame not, all of these challenges. You know that, I mean, it was not as simple as that. Vince is this perfect weird little example of the two kinds of, people who tend to be successful in conservative politics in America now, which is either people who can very, you know, who can truthfully say I came from nothing and pulled myself up from my bootstraps, or at least people will believe that. Um, And then there's the people who are born with silver spoons in their mouths and are just believe they're better than everyone. And the thing is, Vince is somehow both Vince, because like I said, he has this weird, unique life story. He spent his first 12 years as this, you know, poor kid in semi-rural North Carolina. But then at age 12, he meets his father. And lo and behold, his father is this dynastic himself, an heir to, um, 
you know, uh, to a wrestling fortune. And he's built this wrestling fortune, and now he's this successful wrestling promoter. So Vince gets to be both kinds of Republican, basically. He gets to be the 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 poor white, and he gets to be the dynastic businessman. And um, it's not as he can say as much as he likes that he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. But the fact is, once he met his father, and then you know what he really had to work to do was get his father to pay attention to him. That's his biggest accomplishment. Once he got his father to have enough baseline confidence in him that his father, after firing Ray Morgan, the old announcer, um, you know, he could say, Vince, you come in and be the the play-by-play guy now. You know, without that, it wouldn't have happened. Without Vince Sr. saying, hey, I need somebody in this role. Who can I trust? Well, I'll go with my family and make this nepotistic decision. Without that, you don't have Vince ending up in wrestling. Without Vince meeting his father, which only happens because Vince's father's second wife bullies Vince Sr. into meeting Vince. You know, if that didn't happen, we wouldn't be living in the wrestling world that we're in. We wouldn't be living in the world world that we're in. My last question is just looking at – sort of take us behind the scenes of sort of your your deadline on this book as well when all of this is unfolding with Vince McMahon. In the summer, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I finished the book – you know, the book, uh, the first draft was completed in the, I think it was like June 26th or something like that, 25th, 26th, which was right around when the allegations were first coming out in the Wall Street Journal about the hush money. Um, and luckily, that was just the end of the first draft. I think some people misunderstood, I tweeted something about being done with the book, and I think people misunderstood and thought that it was off to the presses at that point, which it was not. So there were additions and tweaks that we made as the months went on until the text got finalized, which I believe was August or September. All of a sudden I can't remember, but we sort of typeset it and put it in a final form around the end of August, beginning of September. And by that point, a lot of things had happened that we were able to incorporate into the introduction and the epilogue. Um, Of course we were too clever by half because we did everything in past tense about Vince being in charge because at that point it was technically past tense and now, of course, you know, it'll be very present tense that he's he's in charge, but our book will be a little, until the paperback, it'll be, some of the verb tenses will be a little uh, iffy, um, but that's not my fault, so I don't think there's any way you can totally predict the future. You have to go with what's available when the book goes off to the press. You know, I don't think there's going to be, let me put it this way, I don't think anybody's going to read my book and then hear about the allegations um, that came up subsequent to the book finishing its text and then be surprised. I don't think anybody's going to read my book, find out about what has come out since the book and go, well, that's not consistent. You know, I don't, that's not the Vince McMahon that was described in this book. I think everyone will see that it's a very straight line from point A to point B there. Yeah. And I, I would definitely encourage people. I feel with figures like a Vince McMahon, you need the entire, like all the scandals, all the stories to truly be contextualized that, mm-hmm. you know, last summer was simply standing back and looking at the completed picture. And I, I think you really, um, you really nail it in that aspect. Thank of you. The book. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. So Ringmaster will be out on March 28th. It's available now for pre-order. Uh, you can go on Amazon to, uh, to get your book. Uh, I have read it. I, I certainly encourage you to, uh, to check it out when, when it is out. And I'm, I'm sure that Brandon will give his seal of approval as well, but I don't want to speak Absolutely. for him. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. For, for sure, yeah. Uh, me, me next time we'll talk about Neil Kayfabe and, and uh, how the wrestling okay. business and, and, and audience has changed over time. That would be yes. fabulous. Now, yes. Have me on any time. This has been a lovely conversation. Thank you so much, yeah. Jens.